Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. And uh, we're going to uh, begin our study. It's going to be study number nine, I believe, on the use, the symbolic use of numbers. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> a dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have to open your word together and to look at uh, the promises and the light uh, that you have given us through the symbols of numbers, through Palmoni, and uh, the light that we have for our feet at this time. Just pray, Lord, as we review this past history um, in this movement and also within the Millerite movement as well, that we can understand um, how these things relate to us in our present uh, study and situation. We ask that your Holy Spirit can be here to teach us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, again, happy Sabbath. It's nice to see all of you here. We're going to be looking at Samuel Snow's letters. Here we have a, a picture, The Midnight Cry. I believe that's William Blake who did this drawing, if I'm not mistaken. Um and uh, this is uh, from the Three Angels Messages uh, source book, though this is the chapter on the Midnight Cry, and this has all of the, the relevant articles uh, that we're going to address in Samuel Snow's letters. So <clears throat> I'm not going to look at every single letter because Samuel Snow had lots of letters. Um, and we're going to take our time going through this. So I have done many studies on Samuel Snow's letters before. So uh, there's some things that I'm not going to go into detail on uh, here because people can refer to those older studies. Um, but I'm going to bring out uh, the things that are pertinent uh, as far as the symbolic use of numbers and the structure and how those, how those were unfolded to this movement um, at that time. So one of the things that, that I've been trying to do with this series of studies is, is sort of lay out how these truths came to us. Um, you know, because if we just looked, if somebody just came now, they would think that, uh, you know, we, we figured these things out beforehand. So, uh, or, or not beforehand, but when we came with July 18, 2020, that we sort of went back and revised what we understood to fit in with July 18th. But July 18th just naturally came out of uh, the light that had been given us all the way back, you know, Millerite history and everything. So um, we're going to look at these letters. Now, when you uh, just briefly go through these, so there's going to be all of these letters. We talk about Samuel Snow's letters, but the first letter uh, that he writes is November 16th, 1842. And then he's going to have another one, or I guess it's written November 3rd, 1842. It's published November 16th. Now, uh, this, these are published in the signs of the times. The signs of the times, I believe, is published on Thursdays. And the midnight cry is published on Wednesdays. I think I have that correct. So you can see that Samuel Snow wrote some letters. He's, um, you know, somebody who's he's not a major person in the Millerite movement, but he wrote some letters uh, to the editor and, and they get published. So he has one written November 22nd, 1842. Another one uh, here that's published in the Midnight Cry on May 11th, 1843. It's not dated. And then Remarks of Brother Snow. These are published in the Signs of the Times, February 28th, 1844. And also in the Midnight Cry on March 7th, 1844. But this was um, his presentation on New Year's Eve at the Boston Tabernacle. Now, why are they published um, February 28th, 1844 and March 7th, 1844? Uh, why is it taking a while for these to be published, this to be published? So he gave a, a, a personal testimony on on. New Year's Eve. Now, what's the significance of his personal testimony on New Year's Eve, 1843? So he's going to give his personal te testimony. Why is that significant that it's given at that time? 
1843 chart, when did they expect Miller's prophecies to expire? When they made the 1843? They, they, they expected it on, on the first of 1844, 1843. Okay, so when they made, when they made the 1843 chart in 1842, they believed that 1843 represented the Gregorian year, January 1st, 1843, to December 31st, 1843. So when they made the chart, they believed that the year 1843 represented the year on our calendar. In December of 1842, um, Miller is for the first time going to say that 1843 goes from March 21st 1843 to March 21st, 1844. But still many people expected that Christ was going to come in the year 1843. And so him giving this testimony on the last day of the year 1843 has, is a symbol. Can we understand that? So what is the symbol? Come again. What is the symbol by snow presenting on the last day of, of the year of 1843, his testimony? What is the symbol? What is it symbolizing the last day of the year 1843? Okay, so Iran saying it's similar to the 31,102 verses in the Bible. Um, how is that? What, um, Iran, because I don't understand that. It's just related to December 31st. The number is. Oh, okay. So three, one and one, two, just ignoring the zero. Okay. Now, can we, can we say that there is a, a parallel between the last day of the year 1843 and the last year of the Jewish year 1843 that ends on April 18th, 1844? Is there a parallel there? Does it symbolize the first disappointment? Or just before the first disappointment. So, so we can say it's, it's a symbol. Because remember, Samuel Snow is going to write a series of letters. He's first going to begin the, the, the most significant one out of all of his, his, his letters is going to be the first letter on February 16th, 1844. That's published on February 22nd, 1844. But we can't ignore the fact that he gave his personal testimony on December 31st, 1843. And on January 1st is when he decides, because he had already figured this out before, that Jesus is coming in, back in the fall of 1844 and not in the spring. So in a sense, for, for Samuel Snow, it's his first disappointment. And then we know that his last letter is published on July 18th, 1844. And it's going to symbolize October 22nd, 1844. It's going to symbolize the great disappointment. So in some ways, we can take Samuel Snow's letters all the way back to his testimony on New Year's Eve. Does that make sense? That he's typifying the Millerite history. Because one of the things we talk about with Samuel Snow is that Samuel Snow is not a person in our history, but he represents uh, the movement. That is, he's, he's typical of the movement. Okay, and, and, and on the first day of the first month, January 1st, he's going to decide that he's going to be committed to this mission of giving this message that Christ is returning in the fall on the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay, so, so in 2017, we're going to, to come to understand Samuel Snow's letters. Now, the first letter, the letter that we always knew of Samuel Snow's is, um, that's William Miller, is, is this one published in the Midnight Cry on February 22nd, 1844. So I'm not sure how many people back in the past knew about Samuel Snow's, any of his letters. But this is the one letter I knew of before I knew of his other letters. I knew of this one. And, and this one is a letter to Brother Southard. Southard is the editor 
of The Midnight Cry. And The Midnight Cry is a publication owned by um, is it Charles Fitch owns it, I believe, as well as The Signs of the Times. But it's 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 a minor paper and it's one that's further in the south. Not not really, really south, but south of, of where they published the sign. So I'm not sure where they published it. I should know that information. <clears throat> uh, but here he's going to give his first writing of, of his message. There's a lot of mistakes in this writing. That is, he uh, equates uh, Artaxerxes as being the Ahasuerus of the Book of Esther. It's one of the mistakes he makes. He he makes some mistakes as far as how he understands the calendar. He doesn't have in this one anything about 31 AD. So he doesn't have the midst of the week yet, which becomes a major part of his understanding. And and he does things which he does later to other mistakes that he still retains, uh, believing that it's going to be in 677 in the fall that um, we're going to have Manessa taken captive, and there's no evidence of that. It would probably be in the spring, but it could have been in the fall, but it's most likely in the spring. So so he's going to make all these arguments for the fall. He's still going to retain uh, the chronology of Miller, having the creation of the world in um, 4,157 BC. So things like that. And it's going to be uh, written on February 16, 1844. So I'm not, not going to go through the article in detail. And um, it's going to be republished. Okay, somebody had a question? Yes. Well, what, was the real, what was the real name of that first letter of, that was fabled to cause days back or sometime back we used to call it a chronology? I don't know. What was its general name? I'm not understanding your question. The chronology? What, what about the chronology? We used to call that letter generally that it was called chronology, because that it was addressing the chronology. But was is it right? Or if I'm to be corrected. Is the chronology correct? Or is it correct? No. Is the letter called chronology as its name? Because oh, we have we have oh, I see what you're saying. Here. So um, no, it's not called chronology. The letter is just, it's a letter to dear brother Southern. So that's, it doesn't have a title if that's what you're asking. Okay. Is that what you're asking? If that's the title of the letter or the article? Okay. It, it's not like others who, which are like the minutes of the week, the, the death warrant. So it's, it's just someone knows first letter. Yeah. So this one is just a letter. Just a letter to Brother Southern. Okay. Doesn't have a title. It's not an article. It's just a letter to the editor. Okay. And and Brother Southern publishes it uh, on February 22nd. Now it's going to be published, republished on April 3rd uh, in the Signs of the Times. And that's going to be Joshua V. Himes. That's who it is. It wasn't Charles Fitch. Joshua V. Himes. He's the one who owns these uh um, <clears throat> periodicals. Okay, so when they republish it, uh, he says here, the following article from the pen of Brother Snow, we republish at his request from the Midnight Cry of February 22nd, 1844. We can find no period for the termination of the prophetic times, but the Jewish year 1843, reckoning from the dates where the best chronologists have placed their commencement. The 6,000 years cannot be shown to require any additional time for their fulfillment. The captivity of Manasseh, at which we begin the seven times, is placed by chronologists in the Julian period, uh, 4037. Uh, that's dealing with the Julian day numbers, if anybody's interested why they have 437, 4037. Um, from this point, 2520 years brings us down to the year of that period in 6,557, which commenced January 1st, AD 1844. Uh, but there is nothing to show the time of the year of Manasseh's captivity, 
The seventh year of Artaxerxes, from which we date the 2300 days, began, according to Dr. Hales, uh, B.C. 458 and ended B.C. 457. Doesn't say whether that's the spring or the fall. Uh, being pinned down to the 4,256th year of the Julian period, 2,300 years from this point, only extends to the year of that period, 6556, which ended January 1st, 1844. Uh, our brother has made a mistake of one year in his reference to Dr. Hales and may have been misled by the diagram in Brother Hale's Watchman Last Warning. Um, so Dr. Hales and Brother Hales are not the same person. There should be an apostrophe there. So that's uh, Apollos Hale, uh, his paper, The Watchman, Watchman's Last Warning, in which the same mistake was made. Also, the 1335 days have not been shown to commence later than A.D. 508, we therefore can find no time beyond the Jewish year 1843. And if there is any time beyond that, we can only wait for the vision a little while. That chronology may vary from the appointed time. While we therefore insert the article, we must dissent from our brother's conclusions. Now, I thought this was an extremely important point. So we have Samuel Snow. He's going to write something that they don't agree with. And they're going to publish it. And this, this is something that I think was a power of the Millerite movement. If they had had a centrist attitude towards Brother Snow, would the midnight cry ever have happened? No, it couldn't. No. Right? So, now it is, it is true that there probably was a lot of prejudice towards Brother Snow. But somehow, in spite of that prejudice... Uh, his message got through. And we can say a, sim a similar thing with, with the message of July 18. Um, there was definitely a lot of prejudice against it. It was actually stopped at one point, but it eventually uh, did go through. And so with this message, we can see it's published in the Midnight Cry, but it's going to be republished on April 3rd. And, and we're going to look at these dates and the significance of them. Okay. <clears throat> And that's going to be before the first disappointment. But after uh, the end of Miller's, there is a disappointment actually connected with March 21st, 1843, because there was many Millerites who did not accept the idea that the Jewish year started one month later. And so when uh, the Jews had observed uh, um, March 21st as the first day of the first month on their calendar, there was many Millerites who left at that time. And you have other ones hanging on until April 19th. And then, of course, many leave at that time, right? There's actually many disappointments, right? The March 21st, April 19th, you could go back to December 31st. Um, some even had uh, the spring of 1843 as a disappointment. And there was also in the fall of 1843, uh, three of disappointment uh, connected with the 10th day of the seventh month because um, and Samuel Snow was one who was disappointed he believed that Christ was going to come back in the fall of 1843 and as he continued to study he realized that it was the fall of 1844 that the prophetic periods ended okay. uh, when you're reading Dan Stig's account of uh, that yeah. history yeah he doesn't pinpoint April 19th, but however, he says April the 17th. Was the yeah, I know. He gets lots of things wrong. I, I couldn't find April 17th in any of the Millerite um, publications. Uh, sometimes April 18th, uh, but they're looking at that as the last day of the Jewish year, not the first day. So I'm not sure why Damstees puts April 17th. Because uh, it was, it, I couldn't find it in the Millerite writings. Right. It could be a typo, or it could be just something he wrote and it's a mistake and just forgot. One of the things I find interesting, so um, Dabstead wrote a book, um, Message and Miss Mission of Seventh-day Adventists, something like that. The foundations. And foundations and... I got that book. 
Yeah, I mean, I have the book too. I just, well, I did have it. I gave it to my nephew, all my books. Um, so, um, but anyway, yeah, yeah, something foundations and something of seven day Adventists. Anyway, it goes back to study Miller and history. There's a lot of mistakes in that book. And, and I, and I wondered about it. And, and one of the things I can say is just that Millerite history was not meant to be understood until it was the seven thunders were unsealed. And that this movement understands Millerite history in a way that none of our historians have ever understood. So I, I think that's why those types of mistakes exist. It's, it's almost as if their minds are blinded to see what's there, that, that God has not opened it up until this movement comes along and and unseals the seven thunders. That that's my opinion on that. Okay, thanks for that, Stephen. <clears throat> now um, there's going to be a letter that's uh, uh, published in the Signs of the Times. Now we don't consider this um, in the line of Samuel Snow's letters. This is so the Signs of the Times is published Wednesday, the Midnight Cry is published Thursday. That's how it works. So the Signs of the Times is going to publish a letter from Samuel Snow. Now, we, we, it's not a letter that address, addresses the fall of 1844. It's, it's actually going to address the mockers. So after the first disappointment, uh, Brother Snow writes this letter that's then published on May 1st, 1844, uh, where he talks about uh, the people who were mocking them. Uh, so it's not, it's not normally part of the structure. Because it's not saying anything about Jesus coming back in the fall or anything. So it's nothing to deal with the prophecies. But it is addressing the first disappointment. So so it it is an important letter in that sense. And then we're going to have the next one here is is his second letter. Now, this is published in the Midnight Cry, May 2nd, 1844. Now, it says death warrant of Jesus Christ. That's, that's not actually the title of it. He's just going to quote from this so-called death warrant of Jesus Christ, which is a forgery. It's not an actual document. I wrote a paper on it showing that it's, oh, it, it, it doesn't fit with the history that we have. We can tell there's all kinds of anachronisms, like calling a Roman citizen the name Caput, which would not be a name. That's a name from uh, Shakespeare. Roman name from Shakespeare, but not a Roman name uh, from the time of Christ. And also the name Raphael Robani. Raphael was not a name uh, that existed in Jewish literature anywhere. It is something from the Renaissance. So um, <clears throat> so it's kind of, uh, there's lots of things about it um, that show that it's, it's a uh, forgery. Now, this is going to be the basis, though, of this second letter. And uh, so he's going to be addressing the midst of the week. That is, he's going to be addressing the fact that Jesus would be crucified in 31 AD. Uh, and we're going to touch on that a little bit more as well. Now, also, uh, we're going to have a letter written by William Miller on May 2nd, 1844. And, and this is going to be his letter uh, where he addresses um, the disappointment. So he writes it from Low Hampton, May 2nd, 1844. Not sure when it's published. I just had the letter itself. And, and then we have, um, another letter from Samuel Snow. This is his third letter. It's written June 22nd, which is Pentecost. And we'll look at that. And it's going to be published five days later in the Midnight Cry. And again, he's going to be addressing prophecy. And then he's going to have now this one here in the midst of the week. This is written by Sister Minor, and it's also published in the Midnight Cry on June 27th. And uh, I included it because she's actually reiterating uh, what Samuel Snow had said in his second letter, right, dealing with the midst of the week. And then we have uh, the July 18th letter. Now this one's entitled Confirming the Covenant. Now it's, it's written actually on July, I believe July 29th. Um, but it's going to be the last letter published before midnight. And he's going to write it to Brother Southern as well, to the editor. This one is a lot of symbolism that relates to these lines. 
Yeah, it's June 29th, 1844. And then after he gives the midnight cry at Boston and Exeter on August 22nd, we're going to have the republication or the rewriting of his first letter of February 16th. Um, and that's going to be called the true midnight cry. So he's going to correct many of the mistakes that were in his first writing of, of the prophetic periods and that they ended in the fall. So this is basically what he presented at Exeter. It's just going to be published on August 22nd. Um, now there is another, uh, article that's pu published on August 22nd as well. So he has this and then, uh, and then he's going to have, I don't know why it's not here. Why is it not here? Uh, there's going to be some other ones, September 19th. There is another letter. I don't know why it's not in here. I think, ah, here it is. Prophetic chronology. So this one's also published on August 22nd, the same date as the true midnight cry is. And, and often, uh, people just think it's the same, the same thing. They see the date August 22nd and believe that this is, is, is the same idea. And here he's going to be dealing with the confirming of the covenant as well, dealing with the 70 weeks. So all these letters are important, but it's the structures of these other letters that we want to look at. So I'm going to go back here. So we spent some time going through the book of Ezra, uh, seven to 10. And uh, we can see those dates on the bottom in 457 BC, first day of the first month, they leave Babylon, uh, Ezra does, and then he gets to the river Ahava and then leaves that on the 12th day of the first month, rise to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. And we have this chiasm with Pentecost in the middle in the 254 day periods. And then we had, um, this one doesn't show the three days, but there's three days, and three days over here in the center of that is going to be the day of atonement. And we can see that 457 relates to 1844, the chiasm there where we have the fifth day of the fourth month as the center. That's going to be Boston. And we have this 187 days. We can see that uh, this, this chiasm here relates to the center date of this chiasm, the fifth day of the fourth month. These are 54 days, which symbolize the fifth day of the fourth month. And obviously the hundred and, uh, uh, seven days represent the 10th day of the seventh month. So it represents Boston. We also uh, are going to look at Ezekiel a bit more too in relationship to this and some more stuff in Ezra as well. Um, so we know that Ezekiel begins on the fifth day of the fourth month prophesying and his last listed date in his book is chapter 40, which is going to be the 10th day of the seventh month. So we can see that Ezekiel and uh, Samuel Snow have symbols that are attached to each other. We also know the prophecy of Josiah Litch, uh, which we're going to look at as well. Um, not today, but we will look at the prophecy of Josiah Litch and how that relates to Ezekiel. So there's a lot of things um, that, that and we have touched on those, but we're going to touch on them as these things unfold. So remember in 2016, I'm going to understand the connection between Josiah Litch and uh, the prophecy of Josiah. That's going to be presented um, July 16th, uh, 2016 at uh, the School of the Prophets, even though it was uh, a sermon that would have been at Lambert, except that the power was out over much of Arkansas, including the Lambert Church, but not at the School of the Prophets. And then... Um, uh, in 2017, we're going to come to understand Samuel Snow's letters. So these things are all going to relate to each other. Now, early in 2017, I had gone to Eatonville and Jeff was there and I presented to him the chiasm dealing with the 10th day of the seventh month. Uh, I don't think I understood the, the one with uh, the Pentecost in 457 BC. I might have. I might have just figured that out. I don't remember. And it was just, you know, in between some of his presentations, uh, I presented it to him. So 
So at that time in 2017, I'm understanding more about uh, 457 BC and these chiasms. And then what's going to happen in 2017 is that uh, we know about the first letter, right? The February 16th one. But what's going to happen is we're going to start looking at these letters in more detail. Now, I believe it's Tabo who starts bringing up the subject of Samuel Snow's letters. It is a um, a new idea called the prediction before midnight, the PBM. Now, this wasn't uh, Tabo didn't come up with this. I think it was Blessings who did. Um, it was any, anyway somebody in Africa who came up with this. That there's this thing called this prediction before midnight. Now, this is never accepted by Parminder. Um, but it is something that is discussed a great deal within the movement in 2017. And, and Tabo is the one pushing for it. And, and that is they believe that there is a prediction made before midnight. So if we understand midnight from 2016, we have this understanding of this way mark of midnight. And we believe that midnight is going to come. We don't have attached to it raffia yet because that's not going to come yet. It's, it's going to start. Right. So in 2017, but in 2016, we don't have Rafi attached to midnight. So we have midnight early in 2000. Uh, well, I guess late in 2016 in December, uh, we're going to have the symbol of Rafi, but it's going to be presented in Alberta on January 14th, along with Panium. Um, and we're going to start attaching this to midnight in the midnight cry. But also at this time, we have this prediction before midnight being discussed. So there's a lot happening in the movement. Different different voices from different quarters are sort of vying for attention to what they think is important. And, and this idea of the prediction before midnight starts to be discussed. Now, what we have is we have the February 16th letter. But Tabo is going to propose that the July 18th letter is the prediction before midnight. And when we look at these lines here, I'm just going to try to find. So when we look at the lines here, like these three days, this is just uh, 457 BC on the top, uh, dealing with those three days. Um, Tabo is going to start looking at the three days here, I'm just going to go to another chart where I got those three days all lined up. Yes. So he's going to use this three days at the river Ahava as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. He's going to use the three days of the Butler and Baker's two dreams as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. He's going to use some other periods of three days. So one thing is he's going to argue is that three days is a symbol of the prediction before midnight. Does that make sense? This three days. Yes, it makes. Yeah, okay. And then we have this letter, July 18th, and it's three days before midnight. So it makes sense that the prediction before midnight could be marked by the July 18th letter. Now, we already have uh, Samuel Snow's other letters. So I'm going to go through them here, uh, just so you have them in a line. So we know we have his, um, is this the best one to look at? Okay, so this is going to have the publication dates. This doesn't have all the letters in them. I don't like this one. Let's see if there's a better one. Uh, yes, here we go. So this is Samuel Snow's letters in 1844. You're going to see that we have his first letters published February 16th. And that on the biblical calendar, that's going to be the 26th, 27th day of the 11th month. Um, so he's written on February 16th and it's going to be published six days later on February 22nd, which is the third day of the 12th month. And, and what's the significance of the third day of the 12th month? In 457. Or sorry, is that uh, is it five, five, five sixteen? Five fifteen. Five fifteen. Yeah. The dedication of the temple. Yeah. So the in the sixth, right. So in the sixth year of Darius, you're going to have 
the dedication of the temple. So that's in the book of Ezra. And I, I'm not going to try to rush through this. I, I have a tendency to rush through this stuff. So if you want to slow me down, uh, I'm happy to be you slow. You offer there is, um... Yes, it says 516 BC, but it's 516 in the Jewish year. Does that make sense? So it says March 12th or the 12th day of the third month in 515. Yeah, I know. It it, it depends. What do you mean, <laughs> the rabbinic? The rabbinic calendar, do you mean? The Jewish well, year? The, the Jewish year on the biblical calendar. Yeah, the rabbis didn't exist then. All right, okay. <laughs> okay, so if we go to Ezra chapter 6, we know that the, we're going to have the temple. Uh, under Darius, the temple is going to be finished. Right, so in verse six, 14 of chapter 6, the elders of the Jews... Build it, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now, Artaxerxes hasn't existed yet, right? He's, he's going to be future from when the temple is built. But Ezra is writing this after the time of Artaxerxes, and he's including Artaxerxes in this because there are three decrees. The first two actually complete the temple in, in this year, but the third is going to be attached to that because his decree is part of that, okay? So that confuses people. That's why we often think the temple is completed after Artaxerxes, but it's completed you know, 59 years before. And it says, this house was finished in the third day of the month, Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So we're going to do the Jewish year is going to be spring to spring, just like the Persian year. And it's going to be the third day of the 12th month. So that's the end of the year that began in the spring of 516 BC. So technically it's in 515 BC, but it's in the Jewish year 516, right? And in, in our year it's 515, okay? So it's the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So that date, the third day of the month, Adar, is the third day of the 12th month. And in 515, it's going to be the 12th day of the third month on the Julian calendar. So this is one of those dates I noticed that I, I, I didn't understand the significance at the time. But when I figured this out, that this was actually March 12th, that it's an inversion of the third day of the 12th month, uh, I thought that was significant. And, and that Samuel Snow's first letter is going to be published on the third day of the 12th month becomes very significant. That means it's going to tie us back to the second decree. Okay? Not just to the history of Ezra with the third decree, but it's going to give some symbols that tie us to the second decree. Okay, so this is, is quite important. Now, um, then it says, the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy and offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bullocks, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and for a sin offering for all Israel, 12 he goats according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses, right? So they're going to dedicate the house. They're going to set up its service. And then it says in verse 19, and the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. The priests and Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and killed the Passover for the children of the captivity and for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. So they're going to keep the Passover. They're also going to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days as well. It says in verse 622, which I think is going to relate to. So when you have uh, this Feast of Un Unleavened Bread, that's not connected directly to Pentecost. Uh, but we know that they're going to count from the wave offering to Pentecost. And um, so Pentecost is, is in 1844, it's going to be June 22nd. So I just thought that's an interesting point. Not an important one, really. But <clears throat> when we look at Samuel Snow's letters, then, 
we're going to see some interesting details. So Samuel Snow's letter is going to be written on February 16th. It's going to be published on February 22nd, right? And that's going to be the date of the dedication of the temple in 515. And then they're going to keep the Passover. His letter is republished on the Jewish Passover in 1844. That is the Jews, because they're going to have uh, March 21st, as the first day of the first month, the rabbis and the, um, the Karai Jews both observe March 21st as the first day of the first month in 1844. And they both keep the Passover on April 3rd in 1844. And that happens to be when his letter is republished. So that means we can take the dedication of the temple and the keeping of the Passover and that's going to represent both of the publishings of his first letter. So one thing we start to notice with Samuel Snow's letters is that these are not just arbitrary dates that he writes these letters upon or publishes them upon. Now, he might have control over when he writes a letter, but he doesn't have control over when it's published. And they're going to be published in The Midnight Cry. And The Midnight Cry is published on the Thursday. So the first one's going to be published in The Midnight Cry on February 22nd. And the Signs of the Time is published on Wednesday. So it's going to happen that in 1844, that uh, April um, 3rd is going to be the, the Passover, right? And, and that just happens to be the day that it can be published in the Signs. So I'm just going to look up here, 1844. So... April 3rd is on the rabbinic calendar, the 14th of Nisan. On the biblical calendar, it's going to be the 14th day of the 13th month, V8 R. So the Millerites understand that there should be an extra month, a leap month in 1844. So then what's going to happen is Samuel Snow is going to have a second letter, right? So after the disappointment, you know, about Two weeks after, I guess, three plus 14. Um, so that would be how many days? I'm just trying to figure that out. So that's what, 16 days. And then you've got another uh, 14 days to Passover. So the true Passover in 1844 is May 2nd. And that's when Samuel Snow's second letter is going to be published. So his first letter is published on the day of the dedication of the temple and republished on the Passover, just as it was in 515 BC. Those two dates are mentioned. Those two dates are connected to his first letter being published. And then his second letter is going to be published on Passover. Now, that's the one where he addresses uh, 31 AD, that Christ is crucified in the midst of the week. So that's he's going to use... Uh, this counterfeit document uh, to show that, that Jesus is crucified in 31 AD. And I'm not sure how that really relates, because when you look at it, it doesn't actually give evidence for that. It would not actually fit. But the dates that's given, there, I think, is March 25th, that Jesus is crucified on April 27th in 31 AD, not March 25th. Um, and there's other problems with it as well. But but that gives this idea to Samuel Snow that Christ is crucified in the middle of the 70th week and not at the end, as Miller taught. So it's it's very significant that this letter is is published because he's dealing with the crucifixion of Christ in the midst of the week. And it's going to be published on the date of the crucifixion, right, on the biblical calendar. Uh, Passover. Now, so back in 2017, I was looking at this. Um, I was looking at these different dates. So I could see the significance of these dates so far. I could see, well, we have uh, these other dates that all make sense. Um, before I even go there, just looking at the sixth day of the third month, the June 22nd date, that's going to be his third letter when it's written. And um, that's going to be Pentecost. And we have that symbol in 457 BC 
the center of the chiasm. And then we have the July 18th letter. So this is just kind of a, uh, you know, having these main letters here marked and the dates. And that's going to be the second day of the fourth month because in the fifth day of the fourth month is Boston. So we got the three days there. So, so that becomes significant. You know, I start to recognize that, that there is a structure here. So we have an argument going on in 2017. We have Dwayne Dewey, who is arguing that the prediction before midnight letter, oh, here's what ends up happening. So the May 2nd one, that becomes the one, and I don't understand Tabo's reasoning. Now, ah, so I, I got this wrong. Here's what happened. Uh, Tabo didn't actually know about the July 18th letter. So he was dealing with these symbols of the three days as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And he found the May 2nd letter. And he was then arguing that the May 2nd letter is the symbol of the prediction before midnight. And I'd forgotten that. So he's going to argue for May 2nd. So we know about the February 16th one. He's going to argue for the May 2nd letter. And I believe it's Tanya Beeman or myself, who finds the July 18th letter. I'm not sure which one of us found that. So one of us found it. Now, I know I found the Pentecost letter, the June 22nd letter, and I know I found these various biblical dates. Uh, but I'm not sure who found the July 18th, but it probably doesn't matter. It's just I'm just trying to remember. So. So one of the prejudices about the July 18th letter, even though it had the symbol of three days, which is a symbol of the prediction before midnight, Tabo rejected the July 18th letter as the symbol of the prediction before midnight. He wanted it to be the May 2nd letter. Now, this didn't really make much sense to me. I didn't understand the conflict going on in 2017. I know while we were at, um, at the camp meeting in Alberta, Jeff was there, and Dwayne Dewey was doing a presentation on the July 18th letter that summer. So it would have been, I believe, in August in 2017. And Jeff heard about what Dwayne had said about Tabo. So obviously, Dwayne Dewey didn't get along with Tabo at that time. And uh, so there was sort of this infighting going on regarding July 18th. So after the summer, so I I can't remember when it was. It might have been September, maybe October. I was still studying these letters. I'm trying to think. You know, it had to have been, had to have been in the summer. So I must have figured this out earlier. Don't know when. Cause I remember I pre presented this in the summer, in August. I presented this I'm trying to remember. I know I presented it in Edenville in the summer of 2017. So I'm trying to remember how that worked. I need to probably go over some of my old notes, figure out exactly when things happened. So what I noticed anyway is that we had this July 18th, this May 2nd, but I didn't know what to do with the February 16th date. So we have February 16th because it, it, the 27th day of the 11th month didn't mean anything. I couldn't find it as a symbol anywhere. So uh, I went to bed one night and I, with this on my mind, and I was dreaming. And it sometimes happens in a dream, whether it's, I, I believe it's God's intervention. But God had me have a dream to solve a problem, right? So um, it's not like you have to believe it because I had a dream about it. You can believe it because it's true. It's just I didn't notice it. And what I can say is my intellect did not discover it. Um, cause I wouldn't have thought of doing this. But in my dream, I was doing all kinds of fanciful things to try to get February 16th, uh, to fit. It, it was, it was quite a surreal dream. But then God told me to add February 16th to February 16th. So if I take February 16th, that's a, as a symbol, it's, uh, Two months and 16 days, right? Yes. So I'm going to take two months and add it to February. And that would bring me to April 16th, right? And then if I add 16 days to April 16th, 
That's going to bring me to May 2nd. So it's two months and 16 days from February 16th is May 2nd. And then God told me to do it again. So I counted from May 2nd, two months and 16 days. That one's a little bit easier because you don't have to, you know, count the days of the month, right? You just add two months to May. That's going to give you July and 16 days to May 2nd. That's going to give you July 18th. So what I noticed is that there was a chiasm in, in this history. And my argument to try to reconcile Tabo and Dwayne Dewey together is to say, these are all a part of a unit that, that is the prediction before midnight. You can't just single out May 2nd or July 18th or February 16th or February 22nd, that they're all part of a structure that we call the prediction before midnight. Does that make sense? Yeah, tie it seems to tie it everything together. It says that this message of Samuel Snow's is the prediction before midnight. Now, the idea then is that this movement is going to make a prediction before midnight. And I believe that this movement did. I believe July 18th is that prediction before midnight. July 18th is the last date of the, of this structure. And so in 2017, on September 23rd, 2017, I presented at Lambert Church because I did a whole study of dealing with with Samuel Snow's letters and, and Ezra and all those things in 2017 at the School of the Prophets. And then I was asked to do the sermon at Lambert Church on September 23rd. And, and I say that July 18th is the symbol of the prediction before midnight, but that the prediction before midnight con- con- contains all of Samuel Snow's letters. And that the three days before July 21st before midnight is going to be represented in our history in some way, right? I wasn't looking at time. I wasn't looking at time setting back then. I just said it's a symbol, right? It's a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And July 18th is a symbol of that. I didn't know that we were going to make July 18th as a prediction, that we were going to predict anything on July 18th. So somebody looking at this as this history was unfolding could just say, well, you know, you did this, be, you know, Samuel Snow's letters because you made the July 18, 2020 prediction. Right. If they don't understand the order in which things unfolded to us, they can't really understand the significance of it. So we have like this, this chiasm. What's that? So it was way before that point. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, well, it's going to be a year later, you know, that we're going to have, um, you know, in, in November of 2018. So this is in September of 2017 that I talk about July 18th as a symbol of a prediction before midnight. But we're not going to make the prediction of July 18th until November of 2018. Now, it's also interesting that when I when I do that on September 23rd, 2017, that's going to be 777 days before November 9th. 2019, which, of course, I would have no idea about November 9th back in 2017. I had no control over when I'm going to speak at Lambert Church. I have no idea about July 18, 2020. So the significance of that 777 days before the 777 days of our structure um, I think is just amazingly significant. And also what that symbolized, because that was uh, a failed prediction. September 23rd, 2017 was the Revelation 12 sign prophecy was supposed to be fulfilled on that day. That, uh, you know, the Christians were supposed to be raptured away or something was supposed to happen. 1260 days were supposed to begin or, you know, all these different kinds of ideas. But the point is, In Samuel Snow's letters, we have this structure. Now, one of the things that disappointed me is that God was speaking to this movement that instead of fighting over which date is the prediction before midnight symbol, that that these that they were both right and that we should have been united, that obviously didn't happen. There's no reason to argue which date is more important, May 2nd or July 18th. And and I know Tabo held a lot of resentment because people would say to him, well, Theodore's right about the July 18 date, 
right, with the three days there. And even though Cabo had talked about the symbol of the three days, he still continued to reject July 18 as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. Subsad. So, you know, we shouldn't, we should recognize that God is trying to, to use truth to unite us, not to divide us. And it, it doesn't matter who found what or who said something first. Those don't make that person any more special. Uh, God uses whoever he will uh, to reveal light. And, and so I didn't really understand the fighting that went on. And it ended ultimately in uh, Dwayne Dewey leaving the movement in 2018. And, and partly because of how he was being treated uh, by Jeff. Right. So Jeff was upset with Dwayne Dewey for speaking out against Cabo. And um, and so that ended up ultimately to Dwayne Dewey leaving. So there's a lot of. What's that? I thought Tanya Tanya left because there was infighting, too. Well, yeah, because of she. Well, yeah, there's a lot of this history goes back, you know, to 2017, uh, dealing with the chronology, the infighting going on. I mean, I think one of the mistakes that Jeff made was um, because Dwayne Dewey was the chronologist of the movement. I mean, he was an old man, you know, somebody to be respected. And, um, you know, Jeff said once in his presence, you know, that Theodore is now the chronologist of the movement. I think that really hurt Dwayne Dewey. And I don't think that that, that that's, that it matters, you know, you know, who's doing what, but, it was sort of Dwayne Dewey's territory. So that created a lot of jealousies, which um, were needless. It didn't have to happen. But it's just, it's just a mistake, you know, that Jeff made. People make mistakes. But um, it doesn't excuse, you know, people for being hurt. Uh, you know, as Christians, we should not be hurt. But, um, but it is human nature. So it's something that we always have to be aware of. I'm sure lots of times I've hurt people's feelings by the things I've said, uh, and not considering the effect it might have on them. So, but anyway, this is this, you know, the start of Samuel Snow's letters. Now it's connected to a lot of things that we're going to cover. We're going to go cover, we're going to go back and look at, you know, how the November 19th prediction happened and how that relates to this, how the July 18, 2020 prediction happened and how that relates to this. And sort of show the progression of how we were trying to understand these, these letters. And there's, cause there's still a lot more in Samuel Snow's letters than what we see here. Okay. <clears throat> any final thoughts before we close with prayer? And also, if anybody has any questions, you know, you can always write them on the video on YouTube, uh, when you watch it. If anybody's, who's going to watch it, but. Um, isn't here right now, or even if you're here, you can always write a, watch it again and write a question uh, or a comment or something that you noticed. Um, Just write a comment or question on the uh, WhatsApp or. Well, I like you know. it on YouTube. I like it right on the video in YouTube because then anybody who's watching the video will see it. If you do it in the Facebook, you know, then not everybody's going to see it. But if anybody well, watches, video they'll watch it on youtube because that's what it will be so that means everybody can see it so i always prefer the comments to be on the youtube video itself not in whatsapp or not in uh you know if you're commenting on the video i mean people can ask me questions in whatsapp but i like when they're on the video themselves okay let's close in prayer a dear father in heaven we are so thankful for the light you have given in the past and even this light which was given to us seven years ago uh, regarding Samuel Snow's letters and the prediction before midnight. And I know, Lord, that many of us don't understand these things. We have a, a partial knowledge of them. And even my, uh, my memory of these things is, is fading a bit. And so, Lord, I just ask that um, as we continue to study, um, the past history that we can see clearly how you have led and that we can see things that we didn't notice before. And so we just ask Lord that uh, you can be with us through the rest of the Sabbath. And we pray for the study tomorrow morning and throughout the week. And uh, we ask Lord that um, 
our characters can be changed, that we can heed the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.